Good morning. Welcome to the worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. One quick announcement. Uh, it's not really an announcement, it's more like a little mini Bible study. Because I know there are some people that don't like the fact that we sing hymn number 666. Uh, there's a story behind that, why that hymn, a little flock turned out the boat, has that number. Because it's an exorcistic hymn, it's a hymn to drive away the devil. So if you need a hymn to drive away the devil, you look up his number. And it's right there, so you never have to think about it. You just go to 666. And the number 666 is not actually the number of the devil. It is, you know, if you read Revelation 14, I think it's in, it's a human number. It's the number of man. And that's why it's 666, because the number of God is 777. That's the number of perfection. And when we try to be our own gods, we try really hard, but we always fall short of 777. That's why that number is 666. It really, it's not the number of the devil. It, there's nothing superstitious about it. It's only a number. But it just shows us that as much as we try, we are always going to fall short of the perfection of God. May the Lord bless your worship this morning. Yes. 
to say, hopefully, give us some bigger sufferings and die. Of the only beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, and for us that we will be. On this year's confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead of my command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to grace. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart with your ear. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. My Lord, I give you my For great is your steadfast love toward me. You deliver my soul from the depths of O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life. And they do not set me before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious. Slow to anger, and I may say that they Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childhood until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Alleluia. Son of man will send his angels, 
and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord.
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grace to you and peace from who is and who was and who is to come. Our last few difficult sayings of Jesus have had a lot to say about the divisions that following Christ will have between us and the unbelieving world. And at times it does indeed sound pretty bleak. Yet Christ promises that he will build his church on earth regardless. His word shall not return to be empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it, and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the gospel promise that we so desperately need to hear today, because it seems as though every single thing we see or hear about is about division and defeat. And the devil seeks to turn us one against the over against another over little differences blown out of proportion, pitting sheep against shepherd, seeking alliances with wolves. We're in a spiritual battle with Satan, yet it is merely a battle in a far more massive campaign. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But the dragon was not strong enough to prevail, so there was no longer any place left in heaven for him and his angels. So that huge dragon, that ancient serpent, the one called devil, and his Satan, who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels along with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the ruling authority, his Christ, have now come. Because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses them day and night before our God, has been thrown down. But they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. This is no military war, but a war on the law and the morality delivered to us by Almighty God. Our adversary Satan stood as our accuser since the moment he first uttered to us, did God actually say? And he's been at work ever since. Jesus appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. Satan's best party trick to date has been to convince the world that he does not exist. The devil isn't real. It's all in your imagination. We're the real devils. When a man is so capable of such great evil, who needs to maintain the myth of a supernatural being, some supposed fallen angel who tries to lead you astray? Yeah, we humans love nothing more than to think we're the real agents of change at the center of our universe, and we're more than happy to take all the credit, good or bad, we're all that there is. And that's precisely what Satan wants you to believe. Like some diabolical wizard of Oz, he stands in the shadows pulling the strings, whispering those sweet, murderous words of hatred into your ears. Sharing the word of God can seem pretty discouraging. Most often it appears as though it falls on deaf ears. And the devil plants the idea in your head. You're wasting your time. Just live for yourself. These other folks don't matter. In fact, they seem happier than you are. Why not join them? Lie is grafted upon lie. But God has gifted us with his Holy Spirit, Jesus says, telling us the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you do not know from where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Yet so often that just doesn't seem to be enough. We've become so results-oriented in our country, or our culture, that we think God owes us some kind of progress report to know 
how we're doing. What happened to the simple trust that we put in the Lord? We modern humans have achieved technological wonders. We've built monuments to our ingenuity to the heavens that would put the ancient stone tower of Babel to shame. Science has pushed back our view of the universe almost to the moment of creation. Yet children around the world continue to not have enough food to eat. We fight over what color signs we choose to put in our front lawn. We pick sides so extreme that the truth lays on the ground between us, discarded by both sides. And Satan continues to laugh at us. Because in our sinful condition, we dismiss his influence on us as nonsense, superstition, or we just forget that he exists altogether. And we even arrogantly assume that we're the devils, we're the gods, and the spiritual warfare rages on. At a time when we most need to unite, we continue to be divided. And it may seem a small comfort, but this is absolutely not a new situation. That is why Jesus proclaimed, Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. The war against sin, ours of commission and omission, as well as those which originate from demonic attack, continue to be won through the proclamation of the unchanging gospel, the blood of the Lamb of God shed for the forgiveness of all sins. All sins. The ones we feel compelled to do. The ones we too quickly embrace because they're aligned with our secret beliefs and desires, and especially those sins that we harbor in secret, the ones we think God can't possibly forgive. We think we're so advanced, we're deep thinkers now. Even in our small towns here, where life seems to be a little bit quieter and a little bit simpler, look around. This is a lot different than it was a hundred years ago, despite the slight similarities. But two things never, ever change. The human capacity for sin and God's capacity for love. The disciples Jesus sent out needed to hear the word of God before embarking on their mission as lambs among the wolves. Because as they preached and as they healed, they needed to hear Jesus' message that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Apply not only to those who heard them preach, but to themselves as well. By the preaching of those disciples, the very kingdom of God drew near to all who heard. And in the face of the gospel brought to a lost and dying world, Satan is defeated. Christ Jesus has triumphed. His cross absorbing the world's sin. The devil continues to assault them, continues to assault us, but Jesus has guaranteed that he can no longer harm nor hurt us. Later, the 72 disciples returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And through our baptisms, our names are written in heaven. Rejoice, each and every one of you. Remember this when Satan tries to convince you otherwise. Delight in this certainty when you attempt and then try again to reach a wayward friend or an unbelieving acquaintance. Because while it appears as though nothing is happening to our mortal eyes, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. 
When the devil tries to sow that seed of doubt in your mind, remember what Jesus said in the parable of the sower. We scatter the seed of God's eternal word. He makes the faith grow, including your own. We may not see it, and we may not know it, but we have the Lord's word that it is happening, and it is working effectively. The word of God is a fountain of life. Jesus has given us the authority to tread upon all the power of the enemy. Satan still snaps and bites, but his venom has been neutralized. That ancient dragon is defeated. That is why Jesus could say he saw Lucifer falling from the sky like lightning. The disciples performed miracles, yes, but that was only an outward sign of a much greater reality. They performed signs and wonders. We proclaim the eternal gospel, but it is Christ who fought and won the war that threw down that murderous, lying serpent of old. The great red dragon and all of his forces cannot prevail, prevail against the seal of the name of God upon you. The kingdom of God is at hand. The war is won. You have eternal peace and rest in the Lamb of God, slain for your sins and raised for your everlasting life. So be at peace with your neighbor in this life, so that you may one day stand with him in heaven and shout, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us 
our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you.